Hello, everybody. Here is Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club. And I'm very glad to introduce uh, the last panel of our conference, uh, Whistleblowing for Change, that also signs the launch of our book, Whistleblowing for Change, that, by the way, I just heard that is already sold out. So if uh, the people are here on the audience and would like to get it, uh, please get it from our stand, because then if you want it to buy online, it's not there anymore. But the PDF and the EPUB is there, so there is still hope for the people that are not in Berlin. Uh, but I would say this is also great success uh, for the whistleblowers to know that uh, the book is sold out and also for all the people that wrote on this book, uh, including also the panelists that uh, we have here. So I'm very happy to announce the panel uh, Challenging Discrimination and Polarization, Whistleblowing in the Post-Truth Era. And we have with us Daryl Davis, uh, that uh, was already at the Disruption Network Club uh, in 2018. So it's really a pleasure to have you back, Daryl. And uh, I'm very looking forward to know uh, what you are going to present and, and to hear uh, your great speech that are always so uh, inspiring uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, then uh, we have uh, Robert Trefford from Forensic Architecture that was also with us before. Uh, both uh, Daryl and Robert wrote a contribute uh, on our book. And uh, we have also Annie Machon uh, that uh, was at the Disruption Network Club uh, actually several times and in 2017, um, together also with John Kiriakou in a panel that we had when we were also celebrating the release of Chelsea Manning. And uh, Annie is joining us online, so I also want to thank Annie and really say uh, welcome from us, and we are really pleased to have you uh, with us at the Disruption Network Club. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the moderator of this panel, uh, that is Peter Matiasic. And uh, also I want to thank personally Peter, because uh, for many years uh, we have been uh, working and sharing ideas uh, together on the discourse of whistleblowing, and he has been also a big source in uh, supporting our work on that. Uh, so I'm very happy to have him here finally in one of our events as a speaker. <laughs> so this is also something new for us and uh, the perfect occasion to thank you when we actually launch the book uh, that also your organization has contributed to fund. Um, and uh, Peter is a senior program officer at the Open Society Initiative for Europe, part of the Open Society Foundation, based in Barcelona, where he leads the work on whistleblowing and right to protest. Prior to joining OSF, he had been active in the field of youth work for 12 years, starting with a young European uh, federalist and finishing as president of the European Youth Forum between 2011 and 2014, advocating for the rights of young people and their organization. And uh, uh, his main passions are Europe, human rights, gender justice, uh, citizen empowerment uh, and also tennis and language that <laughs> I know you speak a lot of languages. Uh, so Peter, uh, I leave to you uh, and also welcome the audience here in Berlin and the people that are following us online and uh, I remind the people online also that we have a chat uh, and they are welcome to ask questions to our speakers that then Peter will refer to the panelists later. Thank you. Grazie mille Tatiana and good evening everyone. It's uh, really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Tatiana did half of my job already, almost introducing the, the speakers and everyone. So that's great because it means we can save on time. Uh, we wanna really focus and dive into the topics that we have uh, to discuss tonight. Uh, and it is a, a great privilege. It's also for me personally a, a moment of saying goodbye because unfortunately or fortunately for different reasons I've decided to make a step in my career and move on to other things but hopefully stay a good ally of uh, all the work that has been done in the field of whistleblowing in Europe over the last five years and I really want to thank Tatiana to bringing all these people together and I have other colleagues not so surprisingly, all, and I th need to emphasize this, all very important, powerful, strong-headed, and um, very um, advanced-minded women who lead this work. And it's not that many fields that 
from the outside it looks like it's a male dominated picture, but if you look at the organizations that support whistleblowers and lead the work behind this, you have Anna Myers, you have Anna Gret uh, here with us, you have um, uh, from Transparency International, you have Marie, you have Rima from Global Leaks, you have Tatiana, you have Simona Levy, you have uh, Naomi and Soalette, and on and on and on. It's very impressive that we have such a list of women's names that maybe sometimes get too often forgotten, like a lot of the whistleblowers whose names get forgotten. So I just wanted to, to emphasize and say that in the beginning because I think part of what we are trying to do tonight is in terms of challenging discrimination and polarization is also to remind ourselves of the different ways in which truth telling and whistleblowing are different but also have things in common. Uh, my personal obsession has been with focusing on whistleblowing as a tool of democratic practice and something that Naomi mentioned in the previous panel of calling out or calling up commonalities between different struggles. So when we were discussing in preparation for this particular panel, Me Too came up as an obvious example uh, of you know things where we see speaking the truth, speaking truth to power, speaking up, telling the truth, all these different concepts that we have as very important to bring into the fold and to connect the dots between the different causes that help do what the title of this whole book launch and everything is, uh, is talking about, which is exposing systems and exposing injustices. Um, so with that in mind, uh, just to give you some housekeeping, we're going to plan to have 20 minutes contribution of each of the three distinguished panelists, then we will have a bit of a 20 to 30 minutes conversation uh, between the panelists and then opening it up to the floor here in Berlin and online. And hopefully with this we can have a nice flow uh, of the conversation this evening. And we will start by having uh, Daryl as our first speaker and allow me just to check, I hate this face ID, but it's the way it works, that I uh, have a very nice presentation of who he is and I think it's very important that we emphasize the background that these people come with and the stories that they will be able to tell us and to reconnect us to other worlds. And I think Daryl Davis is one such person who made a big difference um, back as a black American befriending members of the Ku Klux Klan since the 1980s and making them leave the Klan, expose uh, exposing the reasons behind white supremacy, racial hate, and the recent U.S. Capitol insurrection. His piece on whistleblowing for change outlines the grounds of the stigmatization of truth-tellers, starting from the adoption of the informal blue code of silence shared among police officers to protect colleagues' misconduct, leading to severe violence against people of color. Basically, I think Daryl is a whistleblower in everything but in the name, and I invite him to take the stage and to tell us his story. Thank you. Well, good evening. Thank you all very much for having me here. And I especially want to thank uh, Tatiana and Nada and Elena and uh, Leek and, and uh, Jonas for, uh, and all of the Disruption Network Lab team for putting this whole thing together. It's a lot of work but they, they, they came through and, and they did it and congratulations on, on the book. I'm honored to be a part of it. As Peter said, <clears throat> I do not fit the, the legal definition of a whistleblower, but I believe that I've blown the whistle on certain things. And I, and I feel that, you know, the people that I saw here today, the people, the incredible people I saw here last night, like, like John uh, Kiriakou and, um, and uh, reality winner and her mother, you know, these are people who fit the legal definition of whistleblower. But I can tell you something. <clears throat> Hearing them speak and knowing their, their personalities, no matter what job they have, whether it's working for, for a government agency, whether it's working for a corporation, or whether it's just being an, an independent person who cuts the grass at, at somebody's house in the neighborhood, if they saw something wrong, they would come forward and talk about it. So whether it met the legal definition or not, these are people who want, who seek and pursue the, you know, the truth. They put morality above power, above money, finance, at the risk of losing their freedom, at the risk of losing their financial security, at the risk of losing family and friends and loyalties, all in the name 
of speaking the truth and pointing out the wrongdoing and making sure that things are transparent for me and the rest of you. So you don't have to work for a corporation or a government agency or whatever. If you do, that's great. But if you don't, you can still step forward and point out uh, wrongdoing. So <clears throat> I'm going to give you a brief overview on white supremacy, which is a field that I've been working in now for four decades. Next year will be 38 years uh, looking at these people, sitting down, meeting with them, KKK, Ku Klux Klan members, neo-Nazis, the alt-right, people like that. The people who were in Charlottesville, I know all of those people. I've been in some of their homes, some of them have been inside my house. Sitting down, talking with them, figuring out what's going on up here. Let me tell you, this country, my, the United States, was built on a two-tier society. White supremacy at the top and slavery at the bottom. And as we progressed through the decades, we progressed like this. Perhaps like this, but never like this. And in 1954, well, let's take a look at this first uh, slide here. In 1950, the white population in the United States was 89%, okay? Non-white, 10.7%. In 1954, our Supreme Court desegregated schools in the United States, allowing black kids and white kids to go to the same school. Of course, the KKK had a fit with that. They began having rallies with burning crosses and speakers and saying, I am not going to let my little white boys and girls go to school with little niggers. We're going to take our country back. That became a Klan slogan. Take our country back. Take back our country. What did they mean? They meant take it back to segregation the way it was. Slavery may be over, but you will never be my equal. So we're going to take it back. That was your slogan. Now, if we, if we uh, fast forward to 2009, from 1954 to 2009, a new political party was born in the United States. They called themselves the Tea Party. Now, in our history, we had a Tea Party back during the Revolutionary War in Boston, and it was about tax reform. So this new Tea Party disguised itself as <clears throat> they were opposed to the tax reforms that President Obama was, was beginning to implement in the United States, How, which is fine. Anybody has a right to, to reject anything they want to reject. But they used the same slogan in 2009 as the Ku Klux Klan in 1954. In 2009, they were saying, we're going to take our country back. We're going to take back our country. Here is a uh, picture of a, of a Tea Party rally. You can see the one in the, the sign there in the back there. Now, you look at that picture, you don't see very many people who look like me. You don't see very many people who look Asian or Hispanic. We have plenty of Hispanic people in the United States, Hispanic Americans. We have plenty of Asian Americans, and we certainly have plenty of black Americans. So what did they mean, take our country back? Why were they using a, a KKK slogan in 2009? So they had a march on the US Capitol in 2009. I went down there, and I questioned them. I questioned two of them. I said, why are you using a Ku Klux Klan slogan? Oh, no, 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 we don't mean it like that. I said, you realize that's a Klan slogan, yes? Yeah, 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 but that was back in 1954. We, you know, this is totally different. I said, well, you don't, you, you, you leave it open. You don't, you don't close it off. You don't say, we're going to take our country back from somebody, or we're going to take it back to something. You say, we're going to take it back. What does that mean? Well, what it means is, we're going to take our, we're going to take our country back from the Democrats, back to Republican rule. Okay. Why don't you say that? Well, that's what we mean. Okay, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But President Jimmy Carter was a Democrat. President Bill Clinton was a Democrat. Where was the Tea Party then? Where was Take Our Country Back? Now you got a black man in the White House, and you're saying, Take Our Country Back. What am I supposed to think? 
We've had white men from George to George, from George Washington to George Bush. And then all of a sudden we have a black man in the White House for the first time in 2009 and we're hearing something from 1954, take our country back. So when I pointed that out to them, they said, well, that's not what we mean, and they walked away. So now, let's take a look at the, at the next, uh, let's come here to, uh, I said it was 2009. So in 2010, the, the, the uh, white population is 72%, down from 89%. In, 19, in the 1950s, 1950 and 1960, it's dropped down. We're seeing this happen. Now, there are a lot of white people in the United States who realize this is going to happen, and they don't have a problem with it. Hey, you know, that's evolution, that's what happens, no big deal. But there's also a large percentage that is afraid of this, and is very well predicted that in two decades from now, in 2042, I learned this back in 1980, in 2042, the United States, for the first time in history, will be this. 50% white, 50% non-white, for the first time. <clears throat> and like I said, there's a large percentage of the population that does not care about that, they're okay, but there's also a large percentage that does care. Because when you have sat on the throne of power for 400 years, 402 years, that's how long I've been in the United States, as a descendant of slaves, my ancestors were slaves. We came here in 1619, that's 402 years ago. When you have sat on the, on the throne of power for 400 years, you don't want to get off. You want to stay there. You look at the last, uh, the last guy in the White House. He was only there for four years, and he thinks he's still there. He doesn't want to get off. So this is what's going on. People are, are now revving that up. They do not want to face 2042. So now let's move ahead to 2016, when, uh, when Donald Trump ran for president. What was one, he had two slogans. One, make America great again. Slogans are good things, but you've got to listen to the words. You've got to see through the words. What do they mean? What's behind those words? How can they be interpreted? If anybody in here was going to run for president of your country, or if I was going to run for president of my country, I would say, I'm going to make America great. Or you would say, I'm going to make Germany great, or I'm going to make it greater than it's ever been. Who is going to say, I'm going to make America great again? When was again? Was it back when I had to ride in the back of the bus? Was it when I had to use a separate bathroom? Was it, was it back when I could not eat in the same restaurant as you people? If someone were to say, I'm going to make Germany great again, what would you hear? Huh? Would that be back when there was a wall between uh, East Berlin and, and West Berlin? Would it be back when there was another person in power that during World War II? So it's how you hear these things. So that's what we hear when he says, I'm going to make America great again. That was one of his slogans, MAGA, M-A-G-A, make America great again. Another one of his slogans in 2016 was take our country back. Take back our country. Here is the Wall Street Journal talking about whites to lose majority status in the U.S. by 2042. This is a respected newspaper. Here is one from the New York Times. Same thing. Okay, here is 2016. Same slogan as 1954 with the Ku Klux Klan in 2016. Same slogan in 2009. He won, and that's fine. 
Not everybody who voted for Donald Trump is a racist. A lot of my friends who are not racist voted for Donald Trump. In my opinion, Donald Trump was one of the best things that happened to the United States. Not in terms of anything that he accomplished, he accomplished nothing. But because he emboldened everybody, people came out of the closet, they came out from under the rug, and racism was in your face. So you had no choice but to address it. Because for the longest time, people have been in denial. They don't want to talk about it, you know, they avoid it, they turn a blind eye to it so they don't see it. If they don't see it, then it's not there. But with Donald Trump, it was there. And, and you, you, you must address something when it's in your face. So he put it in our face. Now, <clears throat> David, David Duke, for those of you who may not know David Duke, is one of the most well-known KKK leaders in the United States in the 20th century. He had one of the largest Klan groups in the US. In 2017, right after Donald Trump won the election, there was a Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is two hours from where I live. I know all the people who put together that rally. And what, the, what they did was they brought together all the right-wing groups in, in, in the country to come to Charlottesville. The, the neo-Nazis, the KKK, the Proud Boys, the alt-right, you know, not, not Republicans, but far right-wing violent groups to come there and unite. And they disguised it as being because they, want, they wanted to protest the removal of a Confederate statue in Charlottesville. That was a lie. That, they only used that excuse so they could get a permit. The, you know, we had a civil war in our country, which ended in 1865, between the Union and the Confederacy. The Confederacy was the South, the Union was the North. <clears throat> our civil war was fought over slavery. It was fought over slavery. The South wanted to maintain slavery because they were getting free labor. They were making a lot of money off the backs of slaves who they did not pay. So the, the Civil War was lost by the Confederacy. Now, so they used that excuse. We want, we want to protest the removal of our heritage. That statue represents our heritage. Well, that's an excuse to get the permit because the real reason why they had that, that rally there was because they wanted to test the ground for what they call RAHOA, R-A-H-O-W-A, -A, RAHOA, which stands for Racial Holy War, and for very short, the race war. White supremacists have been promising the race war for a long time. Charlottesville is a very easy target. It's a very laid back college town. You know, not, not much protest goes on in Charlottesville. So that was a good testing ground because if you want to get a permit to have a rally, you cannot go, go to the city hall and take the application and say, uh, I want to start a race war. They're not going to give you a permit. So you have to have some legitimate excuse to say, I want to protest the removal of the Confederate statue because my ancestors fought in the Confederacy. Okay, that's legitimate, even though you didn't know anybody in your ancestry during the Civil War because the Civil War ended in 1865. But if that's the case, why were there neo-Nazis in Charlottesville? Neo-Nazis have no heritage in Charlottesville. The leader of the, of the Nazi party was born in 1889, 24 years after our Civil War ended. So why were there Nazis in Charlottesville? There's no heritage. It was not about heritage, it was about hate. And if you follow the news, just the day before yesterday, a couple of days ago, the courts uh, ruled in that Charlottesville. They awarded the plaintiffs against these white supremacists $26 million. Now, unfortunately, nobody is going to see that money because they don't have any money. But it was a good call by the courts. So let me show you David Duke, the largest Klan leader uh, in, in, in the country. This is him at that Charlottesville rally. 
Listen to what he says. This is August 12th, 2017. Listen to the slogan. What does today represent to you? In the cameras right here. What does today represent to you? This represents a turning point. For the people of this country, we are determined to take our country back. We're going to fulfill the promises of Donald Trump. That's what we believed in. That's why we voted for Donald Trump, because he said he's going to take our country back. And that's what we got to do. There you go. And now you're connecting the dots. You see where it's going. All right. Then, January 6th of this year, we had an insurrection at the Capitol. Again, how many people in that insurrection looked like me? Uh -uh. This was the speech that Donald Trump gave five minutes before the people marched down to the Capitol and broke in, in there and people, people died that day. Listen to what he says. The slogan. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women, and we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. What does that mean? You see the dots connecting now? You'll never take back our country by showing weakness. You must be strong and show strength. And that's what they did that day. All right. And this is a picture within the Capitol, right there, the Confederate battle flag. That flag stood for keeping slavery. Why is that in the U.S. Capitol in 2021? They want to make America great again. Neo-Nazi, Camp Auschwitz t-shirt, in the U.S. Capitol. Here is a typical Klan rally. It's not about heritage, it's about hate. See the Klan in the back there, with all the Confederate flags, to advocate slavery. A neo-Nazi rally in the, in the US. This is what it's about, take our country back. So when you hear those words, think about it. When you hear Amer make America great again, think about it. So this is my part of my contribution to the book. And I would encourage each and every one of you to take one of those books home, purchase that book. They make excellent Christmas presents. If you already have one, buy a few of them and give them to your friends. No, I'm serious. Give them to your friends for Christmas because these have stories and you could have a story similar. It is a inspiring book to encourage people to come forward, make that step, tell the truth. Because the more we do it, the, the, the less people will be going to, to prison, like Reality Winner and, and, uh, and uh, John uh, Kiriakou. This should be the standard. As uh, Barrett Brown said in, in this last segment, the culture needs to change. Right now, we're, we're living in a culture of telling a lie, a lie about elections, changing voting rights, and things like that. We need to change that culture and start telling the truth put our morality at the top. Thank you all very much. Excellent, Daryl. Thank you very much. It was very important to bring in the kind of white supremacy ideology and hate speech that we don't normally talk about in such a setting. It's not the first thing that comes to mind when we speak about whistleblowing, but it is, as you said, exposing wrongdoing or exposing injustice, uh, sometimes as problematic as going on for 400 years. So really thank you for sharing this story. Uh, this also reminds me of, before we move on to Annie, on the importance of 
places that were mentioned today online, like Facebook, that are, have turned into platforms of hate, as some would say, uh, and the importance of whistleblowing in this era that we are right now, when we have people working in those companies exposing the type of wrongdoing and the type of kind of approaches, uh, for lack of a better word uh, in my mind right now, of how these machines control or try to control and spread misinformation, disinformation, and how toxic they can be. And I think it's a great segue into uh, Annie Machon, who can also, as a whistleblower and someone who has helped whistleblowers uh, come out and speak, uh, also maybe now or later in the conversation, make a comparison about the treatment of whistleblowers, such as the person who has uh, spoken up about whistleblowing, in, uh, who has spoken about the mistreatment within the Facebook, uh, such as Frances Hogan, and how she was received in the public eye, reg comparison to someone like her ex-partner uh, of Annie back in the days. Um, before I let Annie speak, just a short intro, uh, as many of you will know, Annie has helped blow the whistle on misconducts of the British spy agencies in the late 90s, um, will deal with the reasons why, despite being faced with high risks and repercussions, whistleblowers choose to speak out, reflecting on the effectiveness of whistleblowing for making concrete changes in politics and society. Annie, thank you very much for being with us remotely and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Peter, for that very kind introduction. And um, thank you, Tatiana, for inviting me to contribute both to the book and also to this event. It's always a pleasure. Um, and I would like to start very briefly with my personal background because it's relevant to what I'm going to talk about later, even though I've talked about it many, many times before. So back in the 90s, I worked for the British Security Service, most commonly known as MI5, as an intelligence officer. And it was there that I met my former colleague and my former partner, David Shaler. And even though we were only there briefly for six years each, we saw so many things going wrong that we raised on the inside and were told to just shut up and not rock the boat and just follow orders. That we felt we had to do something by taking the information outside to cause a bit of a scandal and to try by that scandal to ensure that there would be a parliamentary review of how the spies were running out of control, even back in the 1990s. And just to highlight some of the issues we saw, there were files on government ministers, um, there were investigations into, illegal investigations into uh, left-wing journalists, there were innocent people put in prison for crimes they had not committed, and MI5 did not reveal that information during their trials. There were IRA bombs that could and should have been prevented going off on UK streets in the 1990s that um, MI5 then lied about its mistakes when it reported to government. And the culminating case that made us quit and made us go public was what became known as the Gaddafi assassination plot back in 1996, where MI6, our sort of James Bond type intelligence agencies in the UK, funded the nascent Al Qaeda in Libya to assassinate a foreign head of state. It was an attack that was illegal under UK law. It was attack, an attack that went wrong and it killed innocent people. So we couldn't really think of anything much more heinous than that. So we did decide to go public. It took a lot of soul searching to take that decision. It's, it, it, you blow the whistle, it's not a decision you take lightly because you turn your life inside out and upside down. You are potentially um, upsetting your friends and your family. You are definitely losing your professional reputation, can never get another proper job. And of course, if you're coming out of the intelligence agencies in the UK, then you are automatically facing prison for disclosing the crimes of the spies. So it was a very difficult decision to take. And in order to remain free and not immediately go to prison, we decided to go on the run in 1997 as the story broke. We went on the run across Europe for a month, literally, we then ended up living in hiding in a remote French farmhouse for a year. And then we had another two years living in exile in Paris as more and more of the disclosures came out. I was arrested. Um, many of our friends and family were arrested around us. And also journalists who reported the story were arrested under the draconian terms of the 1989 Official Secrets Act in the UK. David himself was arrested twice and went to prison twice First of all, when the British tried to extradite him from France in 1998, but failed, but he still spent four months in prison in Paris. 
And then after he returned voluntarily in 2000 to face the music, to face trial, and was then, of course, under the terms of the Official Secrets Act, convicted and sent back to prison. Now, his sentence wasn't too long. He only served six months in the UK. But even so, it was a very high price to pay, not just for us, but also for our friends, family and journalists around us. And that was way back in the 1990s. And I learned a number of very useful lessons from those rather traumatic seven years. First of all, how the old media could be controlled and corralled by the spies and by the government, both legally and just by pure backroom influence. Um, also, I think probably most importantly in terms of the work that I've taken forward since then, what it's like to live without privacy. Because ever since the whistleblowing, I've lived with the notion of not having any privacy in my personal life, be it my life online on the computer, or be it with friends or people I meet, or even privacy within my own home. And that is very corrosive to one's spirit. It's very corrosive as well if you scale it up to society, if the whole of society is being spied on, as we know from more recent whistleblowers. So I want to take it forward because of what I went through for seven years, and this case finished in 2003. After that, it was sort of, what does one do now with one's life? And I became very involved in a number of different campaigning areas, uh, one of which I want to focus on tonight, which is support and advocacy for other whistleblowers that have come out since. Um, there have been a stream of them, despite the draconian laws and the, the possibility of prison. We've had uh, two very, very brave ones coming out in the UK. Uh, first of all, a woman called Catherine Gunn came out of GCHQ, the Government Communications Headquarters. It's basically the British equivalent of the NSA. And she blew the whistle on the fact that the, the GCHQ was spying on so-called allies in the run-up to the vote on whether or not an invasion of Iraq in 2003 would be legal. And she blew the whistle and said, these, these allies are being spied on. It's not going to be a fair vote. She was almost prosecuted again under the Official Secrets Act, but she managed to get away with it because of defences, legal defences, that David Shaler had won during his pre-trial hearings in the UK. The other most notable UK whistleblower that's come out is um, a former ambassador called Craig Murray, who was ambassador to Uzbekistan in the early noughties. And he blew the whistle about torture of the um, dissidents within Uzbekistan. And when I say torture, I'm actually talking about the boiling alive of dissidents. And uh, he had the photographs to prove it. It was a really disgusting case. But the Foreign Office did not want to hear about this. They did not want to break their diplomatic ties with Uzbekistan. So instead of trying to stand up to what Uzbekistan was doing and making representations and ensuring legalities internationally, they destroyed Craig Murray's reputation with a series of tawdry revelations in the media. And he had to resign from the Foreign Office. That's bad enough. But when you also look at what's been going on in the US for the last 20 years, we've had a cascade of whistleblowers coming out, uh, not least Colleen Rowley, who was a former MI, uh, sorry, FBI agent who blew the whistle on all the mistakes that were made on the intelligence agency's part in the run up to 9-11. And she went public about these and said, if we'd acted on the intelligence we had, we could have stopped that attack. And by going public about this, she was actually um, voted Time Person of the Year 2002. And she was lucky to escape prosecution under the American laws. Others have not been so lucky. We've had a series of people coming out of the NSA, most notably um, Bill Binney, Ed Loomis and Kirk Wiebe, who came out in, again in the noughties, basically saying that one, the American NSA and the British GCHQ was trying to take over what they called total mastery of the internet because they saw the internet and the free flow of information as a threat. And they were lucky, again, not to be prosecuted under the Espionage Act they, of the USA. They were threatened with it. Then one of their colleagues, uh, a few years later, a man called Thomas Drake, also went public about his concerns about how the NSA was running amok and um, not only breaking constitutional rights for the Americans, but also spreading uh, spy technology around the world. Now, Thomas went through all the notional legal channels, both within the NSA and outside the NSA, up to and including a congressional hearing. And yet, despite doing everything by the book and bringing these allegations to their notice, he was threatened with 35 years in prison. 
Of course, also after that, we have the appalling case of Chelsea Manning, who was one of the uh, key leakers to WikiLeaks. And she ended up being put in prison again for 35 years and was only released a few years ago by clemency from President Obama. Now, of course, she's been put back in prison because she refuses to testify against WikiLeaks and Julian Assange if Assange were to be extradited to the USA. More of that shortly. Of course, the most, probably the most notable, um, most famous whistleblower to come out recently over the last decade is Edward Snowden. And this is a man, a young man, who came forward knowing the risks he was taking, looking at what had happened to all the previous whistleblowers coming out of the NSA, knowing he risked at least 35 years in prison for speaking out about things he saw as unconstitutional within the US and threatening privacy around the planet. And he still chose to do that. I salute his conscious courage for that. I would also remind people of some of the programs that he did reveal. First of all, there was PRISM, which is, was revealed before he put his name to it. This came out in June 2013. And it showed that the NSA was scooping up um, via backdoors to all the major tech corporations around in, in America, um, all our metadata. Now, whether the tech corporations were doing this wittingly or unwittingly remains unknown. But the fact that the NSA could do it was appalling. And people say, well, it's only metadata. It doesn't matter. It's just who we email and what we're viewing online. It's not the contents of our emails or our conversations. But I would say from the perspective of, of a former intelligence officer, metadata is actually far more effective in building a picture of someone's life, their social life, their political life, their interests, than just access to the old email. So this was a very, very dangerous program to have developed. And it was great that he revealed that. After he came out publicly, he also revealed another program, which I find particularly invidious, which is called Tempera, which was basically the NSA working with GCHQ in the UK to hoover up all our transatlantic communications uh, between North America and, and Europe. And I remember at the time, the Foreign Secretary, who is the notional boss of GCHQ in the UK, said, well, it's OK, because I gave him the warrant to do this, which is fine technically, legally in the UK. He can do that for the whole of the UK. But where on earth does he get the powers to spy on the entirety of North America and the entirety of European citizens too? I mean, the whole thing was just sick. Our slightly less well-known uh, programs that he also revealed, I'll just cover very quickly, was the GCHQ invasion of Belgacom. I live in Brussels, and so the entire Brussels communications uh, system has been hacked. Uh, we also had an outcry about the fact that Angela Merkel's private mobile had been hacked, as well as another, I think, an over 100 other German politicians. That's all gone quiet now. And there was also a very notorious program called X Key Score, which is basically an aggregator for all the information that's picked up by all these other programs, so that intelligence agencies with access to X Key Score can remotely follow you around, look at your communications in real time, look at your emails, track your laptop, track your phone, where you are. And it turned out one of the key revelations was that the German BND was not only signed up to help develop this, but was an enthusiastic user of this. And going back to 2013, 2014, this was a huge scandal in Germany because it broke the constitution. So all I can do is salute Edward Snowden for his bravery in revealing all this and many, many, many other programs. And I hope that his bravery does not get forgotten as, um, as the years go by. This presentation would not be complete if I did not mention WikiLeaks, because I had the pleasure of meeting Julian Assange at a, a Dutch hacker fest, I think it was, in 20, uh, 2009. And I remember when he was explaining the concept of WikiLeaks, at that time not that famous, it was only in 2010 with the collateral murder video that they became internationally notorious. But even by then they'd exposed a lot of corporate crime and political crime around the planet. And I just thought this concept is great. I wish that WikiLeaks had existed way back in the day in 1997 when David Shaler and I were trying to blow the whistle. And I say that because WikiLeaks is not a whistleblowing outfit, but it is a high tech publisher. And Julian Assange is an award winning journalist around the world. And yet he is being threatened with extradition to the USA under the USA Espionage 1917, whereby he would face potentially 175 years in prison. But he's a journalist. It is disgusting. And yet compare and contrast that case to that of a guy called Christopher Steele, who is a former 
MI6 UK intelligence officer who set up a private um, intelligence organization called Orbis Business Intelligence. And he was the man who was responsible for pulling together what became known as the dirty dossier on Donald Trump way back in 2015. This is where Donald Trump was supposedly involved in golden showers and things in Moscow. And he was then sued by some Russian oligarchs. And he was then given by the judge in an American court the right of the freedom of the First Amendment, i.e. he had freedom of expression as someone reporting a crime. This protection of the First Amendment is specifically not being accorded to Julian Assange, who is not some grubby tattletale, you know, peddling cheap gossip to um, politi politicians and political groups in America. He is someone who has actually stood up and exposed war crimes. He is a publisher and he is a high tech journalist and he is not being given that protection in the same way that his collaborators in the old days, such as the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Guardian, have been accorded under US law. So I think the whole situation is disgusting. So how I would like to wrap up just by saying there are various ways that we can fight back against these egregious predations on our privacy. Um, in fact, even going back 20 years, in July 2001, there was a report produced by the European Commission in Brussels where there was a recommendation saying the EU needs to move away from its US proprietary software and infrastructure dependency to establish its political independence. This, of course, then got buried because 9-11 happened three months afterwards and the war on terror started, so there was a rush to um, collaborate. But I think that needs to be revisited and I hope that the EU will start to do that. The EU has also started to develop something called the Whistleblower Directive, which will provide an avenue for whistleblowers across the European Union that will give them a legal protection. However, of course, as always, this means that um, most other whistleblowers will have protection, but those who come under the national security um, infrastructure, intelligence, military, central government, will be specifically excluded again and will not have the protection that they need because they are the ones who see the most heinous crimes and need the most protection. We also have in the UK, uh, just one final point, um, some very dangerous laws that are coming into play that are actually cracking down on whistleblowers and actually cracking down even more on, on journalists. So under the old Official Secrets Act, they are being aggregated and made more punitive under what's going to be called a new Espionage Act. So for example, David Shaler faced two years in prison per charge. Now someone coming out and blowing the whistle on the intelligence agencies in the UK will potentially face 14 years in prison per charge. The same for journalists, previously two years, and now it's going to be 14 years if they report what whistleblowers come out with. So this is a very dangerous path to go down. And yet at the same time over the last few years, the secrecy laws have tightened up and the powers of the spies have been expanded massively under the Investory Powers Act, which means that they can spy on everything metadata, they can do bulk data hacking, and they can do bulk computer hacking across the UK and who knows where else. So these are very dangerous times, one for whistleblowers, but also for our democracies, because if we don't have privacy, we can't guarantee our privacy online, which we have to use now all the time because of COVID, as I, have, I couldn't come to, Bel uh, to Berlin, I have to speak online. Because we have to live our lives entirely online, pretty much, the lack of privacy the snooping from not only state level actors such as intelligence agencies, but also, of course, the corporate data harvesting and the predation of criminals make us so vulnerable. So this is a time that we need more whistleblowers to come out and to talk about these issues. And we need more people to spread the word and, and start developing tools that will protect us uh, more powerfully. So just to finish, I think in the sense of what we should do, the EU whistleblower directive is a step in the right direction. But even within the intelligence agencies, we need to have um, appropriate channels where they can go to with ethical concerns and those concerns will be properly investigated. That will lead to potential reform, which means that they can better protect us against the real threats rather than their fellow citizens. And it's a win-win for them and it's a win-win for the, the potential whistleblower rather than them having to ruin their professional lives. So I think that is the way forward. We need to have protection um, rather than persecution and prosecution for these whistleblowers. They are very brave individuals and they deserve recognition. And that is why the chapter in this book I called The Regulators of Last Resort. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Annie, for that powerful account and sharing no, not just your personal story, but how you have helped others along the way and how you have dedicated your life since on making things better for others. It's really very much appreciated. Uh, so thank you for that. And you also pointed to a lot of things that I think we can unpack a bit in the conversation that we will have after we hear from our final speaker of tonight. So with that, I'll pass on to Robert. We've heard truth-telling of sorts from Daryl. We heard the whistleblowing, the more traditional kind, uh, and the new ways of, of how things are done in the security sector from Annie. And we have Bob, uh, who does it a bit differently. Uh, and I think it's a very nice and complementary new way of thinking about how we can complement the whistleblowing and the truth-telling by doing open source investigation in something that Bob calls piercing the veil of secrecy. So uh, I hope I didn't reveal too much, but I'll just say that uh, Bob has been uh, investigating work with forensic architecture uh, that has spanned from police violence against U.S. protesters to the extrajudicial killing of civilians by Cameroon Special Forces with interlink two different but complementary attempts to drive change in the post-truth era. Big data whistleblowing based on an overwhelming mass of data and open source investigation based on fragmentary image or video evidence. So please, Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be back here. Um, particularly honored to be uh, able to follow such esteemed and storied panelists. Um, and it's great to be back among friends. Thank you, Tatiana, uh, Lika, Nada, um, Jonas, uh, um, oh gosh, um, Elena, I'm so sorry, Elena. Um, and indeed the rest of the team for, um, for having me back. Um, I think the last time I was here, we'd never even heard of a coronavirus. So it's been, it's been quite a ride. Um, we've already heard two very different perspectives on, the, um, on this, the broad field of whistleblowing and the constellation of, of issues and ideas and concepts around, um, around that idea, truth telling, calling out wrongdoing, the pursuit of accountability, um, and really in general what civil society can do um, to resist the grip of this state corporate nexus which um, as Annie has uh, so eloquently laid out um, through the stories of um, a number of um, the sort of seminal landmark whistleblowing acts of recent years. Um, you know, controls so much of our lives, shields the powerful, um, obscures and, and minimizes the violence and the corruption that they um, carry out and um, in many cases embody uh, and minimizes or indeed ignores the uh, truth claims and the situated knowledge of the victims of that violence. Um, so I want to throw another perspective and hopefully a few new ideas into, um, into the mix alongside what we've already heard, building on the work and methodologies of forensic architecture, which is the um, university-based investigative agency with which I've worked since 2017. Um, so let me give you the elevator pitch first. Forensic Architecture is an outfit comprised of around 20 people um, with um, surrounded by a, a vast network of collaborators and allies and working partners. Um, at heart, we are open source investigators. We grew up alongside Bellingcat Air Wars and the, the, the other organizations at the heart of this um, open source revolution that, um, that occurred in, in, in 2010 and, and, and onwards, and uh, which I'll come back to a number of times. I suppose it's fair to say that our unique contribution to that field has been the use of digital modeling and architectural and spatial sensibility to um, human rights investigations using digital architectural models as venues for the analysis of media. Uh, we work with and on behalf of communities and individuals affected by state violence and military violence, uh, environmental destruction and land dispossession, uh, and we produce evidence for legal forums, uh, for human rights groups and advocacy, uh, for activists and also for media organizations. And we're, we're not only that, but we're probably the only open source investigators to regularly exhibit our work in major gallery exhibitions. And I'll come back a little bit later uh, to why that is, uh, why we see cultural forums as such important places for our work, uh, but for contemporary investigative practices in general, and for coalition building more widely in support of human rights accountability in the uh, present social and political and technological conditions that we find ourselves in. 
So forensic architecture exists because conflict and violence and human rights violations have become heavily mediatized. Um, chemical weapons attacks in Syria, such as here in, uh, in Douma in 2018, as represented here, are a very important example. Um, and our understanding of conflict and human rights violations um, is also increasingly created and exclusively communicated through digital media, sometimes in ways which tend to make the truth of what has happened there less clear rather than more. Um, for example, after the 2018 attacks in Douma on the outskirts of Damascus, uh, civil society was prohibited from accessing the site. International investigators were denied entry by the Syrian regime and indeed the only journalists that were able to access the site uh, that were those tolerated by the regime. And we know what caveats that comes, that comes with. Um, and these were journalists from RT, Sputnik and the like. Um, so forensic architecture is in part uh, a set of technical and theoretical tools for unpacking uh, events such as the Duma attacks um, from fragmentary media evidence. Uh, and, um, and, and often where those events have taken place in locations which are, as I said, in, in, inaccessible to civil society. Um, those areas have been cordoned off. They have been, uh, a barrier has been built around them, preventing people from seeing the, uh, the facts on the ground, from seeing the crimes and the violations that may take place there at the hands of a state. Um, so through digital modeling and other methodologies, we're able to reach across that barrier, to make use of information that leaks out of that barrier. Uh, to pursue accountability for the crimes and the human rights violations that have occurred out of sight of civil society. Um, now, it's the privilege of a state particularly to erect those kind of cordons, cordons which are legally and politically enforceable, uh, beyond which the general public can't pass. Um, and now, this could be uh, the police tape that surrounds the scene of a murder. It could be a parliament voting to obscure or to maintain the obscurity of corporate ownership and beneficial ownership. Um, oops. Uh, but it may also be the government of China forcing satellite image providers to uh, hide their detention centers in Xinjiang from, um, uh, from, from free satellite image services. Now these cordons may thus be physical or digital, um, but in either case all manner of violence and corruption can be hidden behind them. So the first point that I'd like to offer up for discussion today is, is this. Uh, whistleblowing and open source investigation are similar and allied practices in that they are both acts of puncturing this cordon around state crimes and state violations, um, of creating a hole through a cordon through which either civil society is able to peer in and understand what happened there, or, th by w or through which information begins to leak out of that hole and make its way into the public domain, or indeed both. Um, now, it might be a little overstatement, but let me say it anyway. Um, the open source revolution out of which forensic architecture grew in the early 2010s, largely the result of the explosion of social media, the kind of the web 2.0 and the social web, um, th this revolution in some respects turned the world into a whistleblower. You know, it made, uh, it, it, it made through... Um, not least, not least the social world uh, through the, 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 the upthrowing of, 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 of a great much of our, our data and personal information, uh, where we are, uh, what kind of things we're doing, what kind of things we like doing even if we're not doing them now, who we're meeting and who we're friends with, and what we've taken photos of, um, into the public sphere. But also, it turned the physical world into uh, a whistleblower, as uh, you know, the physical world as revealed by uh, now widely available satellite imagery. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why at Forensic Architecture we talk about something called material witnessing. Um, the raw ingredients of our investigations are often the physical marks left on the world by the operation of state power. Uh, here, for example, you see a couple of examples of how a drone strike impacts a building. Um, and these are marks that uh, forensic architecture is able to read. Um, but it may also be to do with changes in building use over time. You know, through an example like this, which is drawn from our investigation of um, the extrajudicial uh, killing and torture and detention of civilians in Cameroon by both Cameroonian and US special forces, um, what you can see here is a perfect example of how uh, the open source revolution, the widespread availability of satellite imagery suddenly gives us an opportunity to read uh, the actions of states which are hidden from our view. Um, 
it really creates what, uh, what our field trades in, which is what Trevor Paglin calls the uh, contradiction between materiality and secrecy. Uh, the necessity, really, for state violence, for corruption and control to leave physical marks of its presence, however much they aspire not to. Um, and I would say, by contrast, the kinds of information that are often brought to light by uh, whistleblowers in the traditional sense, let's say, and I'm, I'd be interested to, to think on this idea of the legal definition of the whistleblower and, um, and, 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 and to think how that role has changed as the... As the um, uh, as, as the challenges and also the, the audience has changed over, over, over years. Um, but the, the kinds of information that are often brought to light by traditional whistleblowers, that, that, that might be intelligence operations, as we've heard, it might be diplomatic communications, it might be offshore bank accounts, these can be inaccessible to the methods of open source investigation, which uh, are in many ways fundamentally tethered to images. Um, and after all, you can't see a bank account in a satellite image. So it's not to say that open source investigation is something which, um, uh, which supplants traditional whistleblowing by any means, but um, we, 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 from our position as open source investigators, we see the two as allied practices. Um, but while they are different in practice, there is um, a common theory of change between open source investigation and an act of whistleblowing. Um, each presupposes or hopes for uh, a, a line of causal consequence between disclosure and political action. Um, and, and this line necessarily runs through the public square, through our shared information spaces. Um, and, and here I think we have to be honest, and we, we as open source investigators are often very honest about this in our own work, um, and I hope, um, that, and I'm very interested to hear Annie's perspective on, um, uh, on this thought. But, um, the work of, 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 of us as human rights investigators, the work of whistleblowers has regrettably done little to stem the tide of egregious corruption and violence and mendacity by governments the world over. We see that the Panama Papers, for example, a landmark in contemporary whistleblowing, uh, has ultimately done little to impact upon the vast systems of global dark capital. Um, and you know, perhaps we see in the, the, the bravery of people like uh, Annie in the late 90s um, that, that um, Despite that bravery, um, we still require further whistleblowers, and the revelations of those whistleblowers from within the intelligence community only tell us that the story has gotten much, much worse. Um, and we perhaps should live in a little fear of what the next intelligent whistleblowers are going to tell us about the ways that our lives are observed. Um, so in part, because both fields are subject to and must navigate the same contem con uh, contemporary forces which have driven polarization, uh, which have driven the rise of misinformation and disinformation, um, and, and the slow breakdown, really, of the 20th century post-war order, these are what I at least would call our current post-truth condition. And since we're here not to talk just about whistleblowing, but whistleblowing for change, I think we should be explicit about one result of this post-truth condition. It has given rights abusing states uh, a great deal more space and scope and capacity as if they needed it uh, to further ignore or minimize claims made about their own violent and corrupt practices. And so the second point I want to offer up for discussion is this. Both the results of whistleblowing and the results of open source investigations are truth claims about state power, of course. Both aspire to reorganize the relationship between that power and its misuse and civil society. Um, and as, so, as such, they are both subject to the same crisis of meaning, uh, the same post-truth moment that we are slowly and painfully working our way through um, in the years since probably 2014 or so, I could say generally. Um, so what I want to spend the rest of my time briefly proposing is uh, FA's model um, of response to this particular crisis and this particular moment. Um, so we once inhabited an information system uh, in which trust was fairly m easily uh, maintained between individuals and societies for better or worse, and it was done through a vertical system of truth con construction and information distribution, which is to say that we as citizens received from uh, our governments and from legacy media organizations information handed down to us um, and there, there were very few other places from which we could get our information. Now, I don't by any means suggest that this is an ideal situation. Um, but it was effective at maintaining trust among institutions, societies, and governments. 
uh, even if, as Annie's experience and those of many other whistleblowers make clear, that trust was by no means always deserved. But that system has now been replaced by a radically chaotically horizontal system of peer-to-peer -peer information sharing through social media and the open internet. Um, just as Francis Haugen recently observed about Facebook, however, these systems are essentially uninterested in um, sharing or propagating uh, factual truth claims about the world. Uh, rather, information distribution in such systems becomes uh, a, a function, a product of commercial technologies designed to sell advertising space. Um, which prioritize, therefore, antagonism over truth, and which, as we see, have a tendency to create uh, what Elliot Higgins calls counterfactual communities, these communities which are proudly isolated from mainstream interpretations of reality. Um, and I think these are some of the kinds of online communities which feed into uh, the, um, the, 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 the groundswell of, 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 of racial, racial hatred, really, that has emerged uh, out of online spaces and into this sort of um, uh, show of strength in, in, in real world USA, as, as, as Daryl was, was rightly getting at. Um, now in the face of these changes, the institutions of the old system, journalism, journalism and politics, uh, what we might call the UN model of human rights, these are critically weakened and they're unable to answer. Um, and a certain breed of political actor on the populist right has rather um, understood the terrain more effectively um, and worked out how to use it to their advantage. Our director has referred to this phenomenon, the populist right's, um, let's say, better handling of the new political, technological, and social circumstances as something of a, an insurgency against truth. Um, now, there was something you said in your introduction, Peter, which was... Um, about the, I wrote it down, about the stigmatization of truth tellers. Um, and I think in fact it's something, I mean it's, it both is the stigmatization of truth tellers but also what we see today is a stigmatization of truth in general. I don't think it's necessarily about the people that tell it but um, at the heart of this insurgency against truth uh, I would say is the following ambition to encourage us to believe that uh, we're, we're entirely unmoored from truth and facts altogether, that we are floating in this sea of information, disinformation, misinformation, speculation, and that anyone who claims to offer something true, uh, such as a particular insight into how state power operates, is not to be trusted. Um, and depending on where we are in the world, that person should be considered a threat to national security, a radical left Antifa agitator, uh, or indeed uh, nothing but a stooge of George Soros which is a claim which has been directed at FA uh, a number of times. Um, indeed, both before and after we were funded in part by Open Society. Um, you can imagine our chagrin when we weren't being supported financially by Open Society and still having to deal with that. Okay, by way of example, I want to end with a little bit of audience participation. Um, so here you can see a tweet, um, uh, and indeed we're about to see a video um, published by the Israeli army. This is a tweet from 2018. Um, the claim is that they've destroyed a Hamas training facility in uh, northern Gaza. I'll, I'll um, spare you the long story, but the short story is that's not entirely true by any means. Um, what you're going to see here are four uh, so-called warning strikes followed by two larger demolition strikes. What are warning strikes, you might be asking? Warning strikes are essentially a, a humanitarian warhead. The warning strike is a smaller missile which lands in a civilian area uh, over a half hour or so period ahead of a larger um, missile attack in order to warn civilians that they should leave the area. Okay, so you're going to see this video um, twice. Pay attention to the first four strikes. Here is the first and tell me if you notice anything unusual. And the fourth. Okay, we're going to see them again. Oh, and here are, the, here are the demolition strikes. You see they are substantially larger. So those four strikes are to warn civilians to leave the area, and then the building is destroyed. Okay, let's see that one more time. And if anyone's spotted already what's unusual between those four videos, then do please shout out and let me know. It is indeed. So here are the first four videos that we saw. When you put them 
uh, as a force screen like this, you see that something's pretty clearly up with one of them, right? One of them is different, is, is shot on a different camera to the other three. Um, it has an entirely different uh, videographic feel, um, and as the keenest eyed amongst you has spotted, um, it's 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 not shot from the same camera. Um, the even keener eyed amongst you might notice that uh, the video that's the outlier and another of the three, in fact, capture the same strike. Uh, this is the same explosion going on here. Now, this generates a lot of questions because we have four videos, three strikes, and two videos of the same strike. Again, I will so save you the, the long version, uh, but our research showed that there were, in fact, four warning strikes that day, and the first of them has killed two Palestinian teenagers, two young Palestinian boys, Luai Kahil and Amir Animra, which is to say that the warning strike did exactly the opposite of what it was supposed to do, who would have thought? Um, now, it's not a new prospect that states and militaries should mislead or defraud us um, or, or as their citizens, but there is a certain brazen disregard for the truth and utter disrespect for audiences uh, that is evident in such actions as, of these, as these, which I would say are characteristic of a particular new era of lies and violence by states and their security forces. It's disinformation, plain and simple. Um, it's an assault really on even the prospect of truth. It's, it's, it's killing people and then muddying the waters around those deaths and it's doing so with a willful disregard for the possibility of uh, oversight. Now one response to such an assault might be to buttress the old uh, institutions of liberal order, the old frameworks of truth production, to say that we can't do this and we must, we must complain about this disinformation and we must push back against it. Um, but we at Forensic Architecture would propose something altogether new. We would say that we should take up the challenge of this broken system. We should reject both the horizontal, chaotic, uh, meaningless peer-to-peer -peer information sharing structures which allow uh, lies like this to go unchallenged, but we should also challenge the vertical system which was so limited um, and which allowed such egregious um, state uh, corruption and intelligence operations violations that um, Annie outlined. Um, and I show you this example because um, the use of video material in pursuit of deceptions of, of populations like this is kind of interesting because it, it actually gives us a little grain of something to work with, right? And any of you who are familiar with our work will know that it's very often that we start with the things the state has said and the way the state has documented. This gives us a small... Uh, a few scattered crumbs, perhaps, that we can begin to to, to, to rebuild, to resemble parts, or to reassemble, sorry, parts of this lie into something truthful. And that notion of assembling is important because it's active. And at Forensic Architecture, we think of truth not as a noun, but as a verb, something that has to be done. Verification is a process, and it's something which is done in coalition. Um, forensic Architecture is... Um, is collaborative to its core. We look to uh, build our investigations not only with the communities and individuals uh, on the ground, as it were, those who have uh, suffered at the front lines of state violence, those who are leading the struggles against straight state violence and repression, but we also want to work with academics and with lawyers and with journalists and with activists with uh, a, as broad a coalition as possible. Um, and I mention this because, uh, well, for a few, few reasons, really. Uh, coalition building is a form of protection uh, in one respect. Um, whistleblowers are um, so often vulnerable because they, um, they, 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 they have to assume a sort of heroic isolation, right? Um, and coalition building is one way that we try and mitigate the, um, the dangers that that um, risks. Um, okay, um, I'll wrap up there with my favorite thing about the word coalition, which is that it comes from the Latin root, uh, which means to grow together around something common. This is why we enjoy the phrase coalition building and why it speaks to our model of contemporary investigation because it has to be done together and around something common. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob, to bring something a bit different, something left field, if I may say so, <laughs> without trying to have a political connotation on that. Um, but it's really good that you also brought us into part of the title of this panel, which was the post-truth moment. 
Um, and I love that you ended on the coalition part uh, because that's something looking at uh, and Annie and before undergrad and Marie and others who have worked uh, on this coalition that helped civil society bring about the EU directive for whistleblowing with all the deficiencies that Annie already referenced to that it has. It was a success that was done because people stood together and did it despite the powers to be and you know, had a win of something that the EU level, this cannot be underestimated. It was the first time and hopefully not the last time in the history of the EU that it was a civil society who did something that the Commission itself did not have planned to do. Of course, unfortunately, a lot of people had to suffer for that. Some people even had to die. We had two investigative journalists who died. At least we can say they in, that wasn't in complete vain because that really put the pressure on the governments of the EU to say, well, this is happening in our countries <laughs> within the so-called community of so-called West, of so-called global North, and we really cannot allow this. So even though, unfortunately, as Annie referenced, <laughs> the NSA part is completely out, and those people, those brave souls are continuing to being tortured, unfortunately, and we have to do something about it, we can see what we can do. But I really enjoyed hearing you bringing in a different element. Um, and it is very interesting to start speaking about the whole truth as a concept, right? Uh, when you were speaking about uh, how the information sharing has shifted and changed, I had a sudden flashback of, because I live in Barcelona, I went to this wonderful museum <laughs> where they bring uh, chapels from the Pyrenees into the museum and they replicate them there. And I was fascinated to see that of course, wait a second, this is 14th, 12th, 14th century. What was the language that was used back then? Pictures, images, religious images. That's how people talked or didn't or understood what's going on. And that was a very vertical, I mean, that cannot get more vertical than a institution such as the Roman Catholic Church filtering information to its populace, right? So we came from that to now where we are very horizontally, everybody in their own bubble, everybody knowing the truth and having their own truth and owning it, and that's fine. But it kind of, as you say, it blurs, it murkies the waters so that this brings us back to the whistleblowers and what they suffer is that on, on, instead of focusing on the exposure of the wrongdoing and persecuting the perpetrators of the wrongdoing, or at least if we cannot do that, at least focusing on investigating and solving the issue that they raised, everybody, and all the cases that I have ever heard of whistleblowing is just focusing on the person. You did that, and then it's all about them instead of what they exposed, right? So I wanted to bring that in, as I said earlier, we have a situation nowadays with the Facebook whistleblower that might seem a bit different, but before I give Annie to comment on that and bring her own views, I wanted also for you, Daryl, to comment and see of what Bob was asking you earlier in terms of the similarities of the practices and if you felt any of this backlash and how was that for you as a non-whistleblower whistleblower, <laughs> if I may say that, uh, in your experience of exposing injustices over the years, how did that feel and what can you reply to Bob in terms of some of the new practices that he's bringing in, how that might be helpful for the type of work you've been doing. Well, I think to, uh, to Bob's point, <clears throat> I think people need to stand up, you know, regardless of where, of where they see the, uh, the wrongdoing and the injustices. The more I feel that people do that, that will become the culture, and there'll be less people, you know, facing prison time when, when you know, when, when truth is the right way to go. Um, I have, <clears throat> I, get, I get threats every now and then from both sides, you know, um, from the black community, from the, from the white supremacist community uh, who don't agree with what I'm doing, um, but I'm gonna keep on doing it because I've had a lot, a lot of successes with it as well. Thanks a lot. Annie, we were speaking in our preparation call and you mentioned the word cultural shift that you're starting to notice uh, when it comes to the treatment of whistleblowers and the way whistleblowing as a topic is being addressed. Could you speak more to that, please, and share your thoughts? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, certainly I've, 
I've been working with a, a range of different whistleblowers from different eras. I mean, including people, I'm in my 50s, so people who are older than me in their 70s and 80s, um, including, you know, Daniel Ellsberg and his friends and people like Ray McGovern and Kelly Morelli and people like that. And then talking to a lot of younger people coming through who are interested in this subject with the energy to take it forward and want to learn to avoid the mistakes. And I think that is fascinating in itself. And I absolutely su uh, support what Bob was saying about, you know, finding new ways of addressing these issues and taking them forward. In terms of how whistleblowers, though, are treated, there is a classic tactic that's used um, and has been used always by the legacy media, but I see disturbingly being used increasingly by ghettos on the internet as well, which is to diss them. Oh, you know, they were too junior to know what they were saying, or they were disgruntled, or they were sacked, or whatever it is. And every whistleblower I've ever watched since my time as a whistleblower, so over the last 20 years, has been treated to the same treatment. And um, it, one, it sticks in people's minds. So suddenly, you're not a whistleblower, you are a traitor. You are going to be prosecuted under an Espionage Act or under an Official Secrets Act. This is why they're strengthening, strengthening the laws as well to ensure that you will be treated as a traitor. As I said, the strength of the UK Official Secrets Act is going to do precisely that and give the same sentences as you would have got for treachery, as you still get for treachery. So that is very worrying as well. But in terms of the perception, I, this is so difficult in terms of going forward because of the post-truth thing. How do we judge if someone is telling the truth? And I thought, one of the things that came out of um, Bob's presentation particularly was interesting because you were talking, I, I totally agree with open source investigations. And I think this is a great new resource. And I've seen journalists also do this with data scraping and things too. But I did take issue slightly with the um, Syrian Duma chemical weapons attack because in fact there was uh, some whistleblowers that came out two years ago out of the OPCW, the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and they were the scientists on the ground in Duma, and they were saying that their evidence, which contradicted the official account, the official narrative, had been suppressed by their bosses in the OPCW. Again, I don't know what the truth is, but because of that, that um, truth perception of open source and on the ground information that could be fed to the mainstream media and amplified by the mainstream media, and then this uh, these whistleblowers coming out, these very senior scientists who are apolitical, saying this wasn't actually the evidence we saw. How do you get to judge, particularly when the open source stuff was then amplified, as I said, across the West particularly, and the whistleblowers were suppressed? So trying to get that balance is so damn difficult in this day and age. So I would uh, be interested in, in, in Bob's reaction to that. I, I'm, no, I'm not making a judgment either way. I just think it's an interesting disparity that needs to be explored. I'm very happy to respond, um, though I'm wary of uh, our conversation getting sidetracked into uh, what is undoubtedly an extremely thorny issue. Um, but I'm, I'm aware I'm aware of the um, of the exchange that you mean. We 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 we'd stayed with this story for quite a long time, and, and um, we were quite close to this material. I think what I would say is that um, f to to us, what this what this particular case in Duma demonstrated was um, precisely this um, this uh, world as a whistleblower idea that I talked about in terms of open source investigation. Because um, in, in terms of the, what, what we had was was between two two scientists uh, who were very you know in, in different orbits around the OPCW's investigation in Duma, um, and they uh, essentially posited different. Um, uh, conclusions about uh, whether or not this had been a, a regime chemical attack. Um, now, if this was a, a chemical attack by the regime, then that meant that a bomb had, la had, had fallen from a helicopter to where it was found. If it wasn't, it meant because the, the rebels that were in Duma at the time didn't have air, aircraft or air cover, it meant that they had carried something there, right? So, um, the, the, the particular material witnessing that we were able to do in that case was to uh, evidence the the the, um, the damage to the uh, the the 
um, casing of the chlorine bomb itself. Right? I mean, there was imprint patterns that demonstrated where it had fallen through the metal grating, which was um, hung over the balcony on which it was found. You know, there were uh, other particular and very specific um, traces to the, the, the physical environment, which demonstrated that um, you know, the weight of evidence, at least from that perspective, was um, far more toward the fact that uh, it should have been, a, it would have been a, a regime attack than not. Um, mm. I, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really wary about <laughs> getting tied up in a conversation around this, but, um, but uh, I, just one final point course. I would make, though, is the fact that this goes to the very heart of the discussion about post-truth. Sure. Because we have a situation where we have these whistleblowers who did provide documentary evidence of the suppression of what they had seen, and then you know they are dismissed, whereas the open source stuff was taken as as gospel across the Western media. So that goes down to the the truth issue, I think, and it's fascinating. I'm not I'm not drawing any conclusions one side or the other. I'm just saying this actually exhibits exactly the dilemma that we all face as citizens in trying to evaluate the truth from different sources. That's certainly true. Right, I think that, that point that you just both now made is kind of a reminder to all of us that, you know, it's our, we also need to be responsible for making sure that we try to have a 360 view of the, of the things and try to gather as many informations. I remember one of the most challenging parts of trying to support whistleblowing work over the last couple of years was the initial resistance of some in the community towards what we now call digital whistleblowing, previously known as leaking, right? Um, <laughs> in terms of how, now it's completely, now we promote that we have uh, global leaks here presented, we heard from Secure Drop uh, earlier on, and these are now seen as very valid uh, options, but even five years ago, people were still like, mm, I don't know if that's you know a good thing. And, we tried to support an experiment in Spain called Filtrala, who was using so, uh, global leaks information that was set up in a way that basically I, as a citizen, who find some sort of wrongdoing wherever, whatever, I get documents, I can securely communicate with someone who I don't know, they don't know who I am, and provide them with proof of something that I claim is this and this. Then on the other side, there are people who take a moment to evaluate this and see if this is genuine enough, or is it a scam, or is it just some disgruntled employee that might happen, right? Or is someone who is just with too much time on their hands and inventing documents, might happen. But very often it's just people who are regular persons who want to avoid being a new Snowden or a new Catherine Gunn or whoever because they don't want the repercussions, but they see something that is wrong and they just want to filter it and not worry about it and have it be done with, right? The problem with that was that people didn't understand and also then the next step, which was the filter I would pass on this information to the relevant organizations, either investigative journalists or organizations of civil society that are an interest of uh, protection of nature, environment, or, or specific issues that the topic was about, it just didn't kind of show up, it didn't, fly the experiment, I'm still bogging my head around why. I think it's because even investigative journalists, as good as they are, they in the end need to have their story and they want to have their source and they need to sell and promote their work. That's the harsh reality. <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, how, apart from the post-truth that we're all facing, is this reality of, um, you all, we all need to make a living of sorts, and how does that affect how publishers work with whistleblowers and the connections to, because I think we need an ecosystem in which you have someone who finds wrongdoing, speaks up, either they're brave enough to do the work you've been doing, Daryl, or that you've done, Annie, or you have new ways of gathering evidence and stuff. But, so we need all of that, and we need investigative journalists who go into the heart of that story and then publish after it was verified and, and all those things. But what you mentioned earlier, the link and the expectation of a whistleblower or someone who speaks out, that there's gonna be a linear action between I expose wrongdoing, let's have action. A lot of you in the room know that that doesn't happen, even though you work constantly and daily on making that happen. So what can we do 
where is that little thing that's part that needs to be, or what do we need to change to help that, to make that action? Uh, I would say uh, implement more, more protection. Um, perhaps just like, you know, no, nobody likes a snitch, essentially. You know, the police don't like it, organized crimes don't like it. When we were all kids, we had siblings, and when your, your brother went and told your mom you smashed the flower vase, you know, you didn't like it, you know. So <clears throat> with the police, you know, there's retaliation from their own. You know, if you go to the brass and report wrongdoings. So, you know, if you don't want to participate, that's fine, but you don't tell on me. Um, just like <clears throat> when police investigate a crime where somebody's been murdered or has been raped, they know somebody in that neighborhood knows who did it, but nobody wants to come forward. So then they put out a thing on TV or some posters, you know, tipsters anonymous, you don't have to leave your name, you just give us information. Well, the whistleblowers need something like that as well, where they don't have to reveal their name and have some kind of protection where, where there's no ramification. You know, that would bring, bring more people, I think, you know, to the forefront because oftentimes the, the, the very people that you go to to complain, you know, they've moved up the ranks like in the police department to what, what's called uh, internal affairs. And how are they going to condemn officer so-and-so for brutalizing somebody or shooting him in the back or whatever when they were doing it themselves when they were down on the street? So this, this is why it's important that, that these people can, can remain anonymous but still provide that information. Andy, do you want to come in as someone who has done everything right internally and still didn't help and then had to go <laughs> out and compare maybe that experience with the experiences of today and what we just saw like with the Facebook whistleblower uh, and the reception of that uh, compared to yeah, maybe yeah, some of the sure. other examples? Thank you. No, I think um, I don't want to talk about the old stuff because that was way back in the 1990s with very different technology. What I would like to talk about now is um, because I, I do advocate for whistleblowing and the practice, not just from intelligence, but in corporation situations, the, you know, health and finance and all these brave people coming forward and exposing wrongdoing and usually ruining their reputations by doing so. And so when I talk to these companies and a lot of organizations do have whistleblower avenues in place, but it turns out from multiple surveys that the people with ethical concerns do not trust the technological avenues that they can take. It's not just, as Daryl said, uh, going up to a boss who might have done the same thing. They don't trust the tech, be it a phone line or be it an anonymous, supposedly, email line. Or even when it comes to um, high-level whistleblowers coming out of government, for example, trusting thing, certain data dump sites. So it's that lack of trust which is causing a blockage of vital information that needs to be reported and rectified or made public and then rectified you know by laws that is causing the problems and will create more whistleblowers and this is to go back to the old case um this was the problem we had with the mainstream media david shaler and i in the sense that they acted as a blockage because they could be controlled um between what we wanted to say and what went out to the public, both by law and also by control, soft power behind the scenes. And this is precisely why, for example, when I first encountered the concept of WikiLeaks, I was such an enthusiast for it. And I think that their take on this and their purpose, which was to allow the information that the whistleblower had directly to be given to the people and for the people to be enabled to see what was being done in their name by the governments or what was being done by corporations or what was being done illegally in illegal wars, for example, was an amazing concept. I think what was disappointing, not only to WikiLeaks, to many of other of us, is that most people didn't care. So <laughs> what to do about that? That is the key problem. Um, that and whistleblowers feeling secure in any environment, they can securely drop their information electronically which is always going to be a problem because our hardware is screwed as well. But in terms of making people care, why should we worry about wars going on in other countries? Why should we worry about infringements going on in other countries? Why should we worry about torture or extradition or extraordinary rendition or murder by drones and all that sort of thing? I think those chickens are coming home to roost, though, particularly in America with the 
friction um, around racial issues again and the political polarization. And I think we're seeing it also in Europe with the polarization around COVID and um, how much we want to be monitored or if we have COVID passports, how much we want our biometric data to be stored um, and who's going to store it and who's going to access it. So there are all these different competing issues and competing, but I think the key thing is how to make people care. And I think whistleblowers have played a part and they will continue to play a part going forward. But I think it's going to be the social movements and the cultural shifts, as you mentioned, Peter, that it's little nudges that can change a whole culture's direction as it has with universal suffrage in the past or with the political abolition of slavery or with gender identity politics now. These are all little nudges in the right direction rather than these big scandals of whistleblowing. So it's combining the two and making sure everyone participating is secure doing so and protected. Thanks, Andy. So one more intervention by Bob before we then open the floor uh, to both our online viewers who might have questions on the floor here in Berlin. Bob? Thank you. Um, I had a question for you, Daryl, actually. Um, because we've been talking a little bit now and touching on social media as um, something which has obviously created profound cultural shifts in the last decade and a bit, um, has also created a lot of technological possibilities for my field. Um, I'm, I'd, I'd also be really interested to hear Annie's reflections on what's different about uh, Francis Haugen and the Facebook whistleblower as compared to um, maybe some of the other landmark cases that we've had. But I first, I would be really interested to hear from you how in your decades of experience of speaking to people across the spectrum of the right, um, how those conversations have changed in the kind of post Facebook and social media era. How do those, um, the, the mentalities and the, the um, positions that you, you, you see across the table from you in those conversations, how have they changed in light of social media? Well, I think uh, in, in social media, you know, you can be one person sitting in your basement and advertise you have a group that has 500 members or whatever, it's only just you. So, you know, people put out, it's, it's like dating online, you can be whoever you want to be, <laughs> you know, and, until you meet that person, <laughs> person right? Yeah. So, so, you know, there, there's a lot of that. But also, um, I mean, social media is, it's like fire. It, it can be used for good, it can be used for bad. I mean, if, you know, if your house is cold, I can bring fire and, and heat your house. Or if I'm mad at you, I can bring fire and burn your house down. So, depending upon how, how we use it, um, I, I've had a lot of success on social media. I've had people uh, email me and say, hey, I saw you on TED Talk or I saw you on Joe Rogan or whatever, and these are white supremacists who, who watch the show or whatever and they want to learn more. Next thing I know, you know, they're leaving. And then there are those who email me and threaten me. They send me, they send me my home address and say, you know, do you recognize such and such, you know, house number? Of course I recognize it's my house. But, you know, I can go on, on social media or on the internet and find anybody's address if I spend enough time there, right? Um, so it's, ch it's changed in, in the way that it can evoke fear in people. Uh, you find people getting off of Facebook because, you know, they, they feel they're being invaded. They, you know, their privacy is being, is being put out there. They're being doxxed or whatever. But also it allows you to communicate, you know, with, with your antagonist directly, you know, through messaging. And I've, I've had a lot of success, you know, success with that as well. Um, whereby before, you know, you'd have to meet these people in person um, that, you know, dep uh, me, I don't mind meeting those people in person. But for some people, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of daunting. You know, here's somebody who, who, you know, does not like me because I'm Jewish or because I'm black or because I'm gay or because I'm Muslim or because I'm, I'm not what they are. Do I really want to meet this person in person knowing their baggage and their history? Thanks a lot. Annie, do you want to mention the difference between the treatment of the Facebook whistleblower? Uh, well, yeah, I would like to mention that and also the treatment of financial whistleblowers. So, um, Frances Haugen case, I mean, it's great that she stood up and she's done this, but what is interesting particularly is the power brokers behind her who are enabling her to amplify her message. And I mean, I, I have no brief for Facebook. I've, I've said for over a decade, it's the spy's wet dream because we're just offering up information. It used to take the spies months to gather about each of us. 
Um, so it's great that she's speaking out about it and how malign their practices are. But what interests me is who's backing her and why she's having such an easy ride and the power brokers. And I think to a certain extent, this looks to me like a concerted political attempt at a takedown or a monopoly break, you know, to break up the robber baron type um, image. So that's interesting to watch. Um, but also in terms of how whistleblowers generally are treated, I've been talking about the extreme end, you know, the intelligence government, military, central um, uh, diplomats and people like that. In terms of finance people, that fascinates me too, because all the rest I talk about face prison or financial or professional ruin. Whereas with the Frank Dodds Act in the USA, anyone coming out of any financial institution from any nationality that reports back to the USA and says, this corporation is doing something that is defrauding or is wrong or is um, stripping profits from the shareholders, they will be invest that case will be investigated. And if that case is found to be true, the whistleblower will get 10% of the money recouped from that investigation. So I kid you not, there have been financial whistleblowers coming out of banks which, which have been doing wrong. They've been caught out. And the whistleblower, some of them have received over $100 million for their whistleblowing. So they don't face financial ruin. They don't face reputational ruin. They don't face prison. They are rewarded for exposing the crimes of those who might threaten, I think is the best way of putting it, the profits of the shareholders. So the disparity between that and state level act, uh, whistleblowers or even, you know, people coming out of things like the National Health Service or health sector um, anywhere is an astonishing difference. And it shows, I think, the moral uh, decrepitude of the West, capitalist decrepitude of the West, that it's all about protecting the interests of the shareholders and not protecting the interests of society and the population and those around the planet who might be predated on by the West as well. I think that was a mic drop, so I think it's good to <laughs> go to <laughs> questions at this point. <laughs> Thanks, Annie. Okay. Lika? <laughs> yes, there is a question from our online audience for Annie Machon. Um, why do you mm -hmm. say it is worse or more invasive if the NSA had access to our metadata rather than access to the actual content of our emails? Ah, yeah. Um, I was saying this is how the spies responded to that first PRISM disclosure by Edward Snowden. They said it's only metadata. Um, so it's only, you know, who you're emailing or what you're looking at um, on the Internet and things. So what I was suggesting is that if you have an overview of someone's total activity online, you get a much wider idea of their, their life, you know, who they're in relationships with, who they're um, politically involved with. Uh, what their work is, all the rest. It's, it's a big picture. So it gives you an overview. And that, if everything is gathered up in that way, that means that you have an overview of everyone, which is exactly what PRISM was doing. So if you then go down what is supposed to be the proportionate path in a democracy, where you only target the baddies because you put up a case, then you are looking at the actual content. And you can look at certain emails that might be coming through, but you might not have access to other more secret emails or the fact they're using something through the dark web or something. So you don't get the full picture. So if you are definitely targeting someone specifically, you'll probably get a, a much better idea. But just to get a flavor of someone's life and how they are operating and who they're involved with, metadata is the key. So it's just the fact that the NSA basically said, that's not important, it's not invasive. It is incredibly invasive. It's gold dust for the intelligence agencies to get that overview of someone's life. Thank you, Lika. Thank you, Annie. And now to the floor here in Berlin. I know it's already after nine in the evening, but if there's anyone who has questions, we'll be happy to answer, or our panelists will be happy to answer. Anna, can you briefly introduce yourself, even though you were a moderator yesterday, so people know you, but still. Uh, can you hear me? So, yeah. Um, Anna Myers, uh, Executive Director of the Whistling International Network. Um, I have uh, heard and talked to Annie before, and, um, and I, I always find her view um, really important because she is a whistleblower and has a longer view. Having done a history degree, la longue durée is really helpful. Um, and so does Daryl have a long history of watching uh, uh, the civil rights movement and, and white supremacy and making those connections for people. 
Um, and with you, Bob, I absolutely, that was great because I hadn't really known anything about the forensic architecture world. And so putting those pieces together and seeing that you can still do forensic investigations with these traces that do put things uh, back on track or can put things back on track is really important. But you talked about coalition. And I would like to ask um, Daryl in particular, because uh, there is this sense of polarization and there is this sense of disinformation. But you just said, which I thought was really important, you know, you can be anything in your bedroom and you can say you're with a group and you're, that's just you. But it does create fear. And the post, you know, trying to get past fear is a huge issue. And the fact that you have, it seems to me, developed um, uh, um, a high sense of meeting people where they stand and talking to them. Um, what is the role of that which feels, and you say you get attacked for doing that, actually going and talking to people and saying, and, and really finding out where they live and breathe and why and challenging those views. How much of that do we, are we not doing even in our worlds of, sorry, I feel like it's, make, it's making me sound like I have a very bad cold. Uh, it's pinching my nose. <laughs> um, well, that, that, that we, we, you know, even if we construct the, a reconstruction, in the end I'm still looking at pictures going, well, you know, in the end, can I trust this? The way that, that Annie said. Whereas if someone's talking to me, I mean, I can get done by con men probably very easily, but at the same time, that really can work in changing people's minds. So how do we do that bit in all of this? Okay, so two things. One, and this just comes from my background, <clears throat> as, as a child, uh, I was the, the child of parents in the U.S. Foreign Service. So I was an American Embassy kid starting in the 1960s. I'm 63 years old now. I started traveling at the age of, uh, of, of three in 1961. And, you know, you go to a country, you're there for two years, you come back home to the States, you're around for a few months, and then you go to another country, two years. So back and forth, back and forth is what I did as a kid, and now I travel around the world uh, performing music. I'm a, I'm a rock and roll musician. Um, when you combine my childhood travels with my adulthood travels, I've now been in 60 countries. Um, and I can tell you something. No matter how far I go from the United States, whether it's right next door to Canada, or to Mexico, or halfway around the globe, no matter how different the people may be who I encounter, they don't look like me, they don't speak my language, they don't worship as I do, what not. Um, I always conclude one thing, that we all are human beings. And as such, we all want these five basic core values in our lives. We all want to be loved, we all want to be respected, we all want to be heard, we want to be treated fairly, and we want the same thing for our family as anybody else wants for their family. And if we can learn to employ those five core values when we find ourselves in an adversarial situation or in a culture or society in which we are unfamiliar, I can guarantee you that your navigation of that situation, that culture, that society will be much more smooth and much more positive, especially giving people the, the, the time or the platform to be heard. That's very important. People always want to be heard. You're not, you, know, you may not hear what you want to hear, but you give somebody that, there's an excellent chance that they will reciprocate after they've been heard and allow you to be heard. And because you know, when you come together, their wall is up, their ears are plugged, you know, they, you know they, they either fear you or they don't want anything to do with you, and they're not gonna listen to anything you have to say. But when you allow them to be heard, that wall comes down. As the wall comes down, the ears open wider. And that's when you have your chance to impart your wisdom or your information. The most important thing is this, two things. One, um, <clears throat> you only have one opportunity to make a good first impression. You may have a second or third opportunity to make an impression if you're lucky, but you only have one opportunity to make a good first impression and people will judge you on their first impression of you. Because, you know, they may take some time when you need to come back and see that person again. Because you want, you know, you want to, you, you planted the seed, now you want to come back and nurture it or whatever. Uh, if they're impressed with you, uh, even if they don't like you, 
chances are they'll say, okay, I'll meet, you know, I'll meet you again next week. You know, you say, say, you know, hey, I appreciate the information you gave me. Let me sit on it for a couple of weeks, and then can I, can I meet you again in two weeks and just follow up? Yeah, okay. But if they don't like you, you know, you, you, you had a bad impression or they caught you in a lie or whatever, then now, now we're done. You know, I don't, I don't want to see you again. So, you know, your credibility, your transparency is key to, to your being able to, like I said, building trust, building a relationship, even with somebody who, who are polar opposites. Uh, the second thing is this, never, never attack somebody's reality. One's perception is one's reality. Whatever they perceive is their reality, whether it's real or not. Um, if you attack their reality, they're going to push back, you know, and you, and you go nowhere fast. Um, <clears throat> how you uh, effect change with somebody who has a, a false reality is this. Because their perception is their reality, you must offer them a better perception. If they resonate with your perception, they will change their own reality. I'll just give you a quick, a quick hypothetical example. Let's say you have a seven or eight year old son and uh, he goes to a magic show with his buddy and his buddy's parents. And he comes home and he tells you, this magician, you know, he asked for a female volunteer and 50 women in the audience raised their hand. He pointed out one, come up here on stage. She came up, he told her to get inside this box and stick her feet off the hole on this end, and put her head off the hole on this end, and then he closed the lid. And he took a chainsaw. He cut that woman in half. And you try to tell that kid, well, no, nah, that didn't really, yes, it did. I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it. You cannot change what he saw. He knows what he saw. He saw that man cut that woman in half. And to make it more real, he tells you that after he cut the box in half, the magician took the half with the legs sticking out, and he, well, he'd asked the woman to, to wiggle her legs, and she kicked them. He took that half and moved it over there to stage right, took the half with the head, put it over here on stage left, and then he walked over and he talked to the head, and the head talked back. And then he brought the two halves back together, opened the lid, and the woman climbed out, full form, no blood. He cut that woman in half, and you tell, well, it's an illusion. No, it's not, I saw it, you know? Her head was there, her feet were there. So don't attack his reality. Offer a better perception. You say something like, well, I hear what you're saying, but is it possible that just maybe, maybe, the woman he picked out of those 50 women who raised their hand, maybe she works for him? Maybe she was a plant he put in the audience? She knows the trick. She goes to every show that he does. And when she climbs inside the box, there is a pair of mannequin legs already in the box on the floor that are wearing the same stockings and same shoes as she has on. She picks them up, puts them through the hole. He says, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle your legs. She just shakes them, you know? And then, when he cut, and, then, and then she takes her own legs and brings them up, up under her chest. So her whole body is on that side of the box. So when he cuts it in half, the, the saw doesn't even touch her. So he moves the whole body over there. He has to divert your attention from the legs because now the legs are not going to move. They're dummy legs, right? So he, he goes over here, he talks to the head, and the head talks back. So he gets your attention off the legs. And then he brings the two boxes back together, two halves back together. She pulls the legs out, leaves them in the box, and she climbs out. So you tell him that, he says, hmm, you know, maybe that's the only way it could work. You have offered him a better perception, and he has come to, that, to the conclusion that you want. So rather than attack somebody's reality, give them a better perception. Wow. <laughs> that deserves an applause because it was... Thank you. I never knew how that was done. Excellent storytelling, but also the visual imagery. I was just thinking constantly about the powers that are out there that are doing this to us constantly to divert attention and how smart they are and they just adapt to the day in which we live, and if it was the 12th century that I talked about earlier, or the 21st century we are in now, the techniques have changed, but the basic principle remains the same. Those in power want to make sure that you see what they want you to see, unless you are then brave enough to... Exactly, exactly. So thank you for that. Is there any final question or comment in the f from the floor? 
One more. We'll take that as the last one, and then we will wrap it up with final comments from the panel. So um, Annie said capitalism is the problem, and everybody always says capitalism is the mo capitalism is a problem. And when are we going to be like capitalism is the fucking problem? Like let's fucking deal with capitalism. You know, it's not just a throwaway comment. You know, and, and like, you know, Bob, you're talking about coalition building. It's like, let's fucking come together and deal with capitalism already. You know, like it's not going to fucking change until we fucking deal with the real problem, which we all know. OK, and I'm like, I don't know. It's like every everything should be dedicated to fighting this issue now. It's like, you know, like, I mean, also, I mean, I, I also do like education and I know Disruption Network Club, you always have like a different theme, a different theme. But we need to just fucking tackle capitalism already and like enough, you know? I mean, seriously. And what's it gonna take for us to fucking do that? And also not just you, but hello people in the fucking audience. Okay, seriously, every single person. Because also, you know, it's like we have to also look at ourselves. What are we doing in our lives? Like, how are we just constantly buying new shit that we don't need or like, you know, because like in the last uh, panel discussion, you know, I was, I was, t I was telling Brendan, I was like, I almost wanted to walk out because it was too fucking painful. And I was like, you know, the people are apathetic. Nobody gives a damn, right? Why are we all struggling and doing this stuff? And the reality is people are struggling. They don't have money. And not only that, but they've been traumatized. I mean, I, I, I run education programs. And like one of the t t topics that has come up recently is like everybody has daddy issues. You know, and like how many of the people that are terrorizing the world right now have had daddy issues? And I know it's not a sexy topic, mental health and daddy issues, but on the other hand, it, as far as I can tell, capitalism and daddy issues are the fucking problem, and I would like to not be the only one who fucking believes that and tries to do something about it. That's, I guess, not a question, but a comment. Thank you. You've been heard. <laughs> So I'll offer our panelists a final round of quick uh, concluding thoughts from their side that they want to impart uh, on us as the audience and before we say goodbye to everyone. Let's start with you because we finished in the introduction with you, so. Sure, okay. Um, I mean, first, now I know how that trick's done, so that's good, thank you. I, <laughs> Hope I didn't ruin anything for you. <laughs> <laughs> Only a couple treasured childhood memories. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> um, yeah, um, how to sum up. I mean, um, I think what you say is interesting about uh, the, you know, the, 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 the meat behind Daryl's uh, analogy there was precisely, as you said, that um, the the um, the kind of trick is always changing. It's always adapting to the new medium. I'm reminded of when Russia Today founded their own open source investigations unit uh, after taking too many beatings from uh, Bellingcat and Co. Um, I don't think that actually lasted though. But uh, yeah, you're right that the um, the trick the tricks will always change. I I I. I, I guess I'd struggle to disagree with you that at the heart of it is the thing that we all live under. Um, I guess we need to chip away at little parts of that um, intellectually and theoretically before uh, we make any um, headway. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of like what Mark Fisher says about um, the um, cultural, and we, al we almost got here actually when we were talking about social media um, and about how the revelations of whistleblowing, how um, huge bombshells can land in an extremely interconnected uh, societal structure and s seemingly achieve almost nothing um, and, and move very few people for very long. Um, and Mark Fisher, the uh, UK cultural theorist, talks about, talks about um, how uh, capitalism is well designed to um, to uh, draw in uh, any kind of anti-capitalist position, any kind of uh, anti-capitalist re re revelation, anything which um, lifts the lid is immediately incorporated. Um, a few disparate thoughts. I'm not sure if I have a, a last <laughs> sentence. Um, thanks. Bob. I want to say thanks again for sharing the stage with Daryl and Annie. It's real ins ins inspirations. Thank you. Annie, the floor is yours. Right, well, I, I shall keep it very brief too. Um, thank you for that comment about capitalism. It reminded me, it took me back to 2010 with the Occupy movement and how they were crushed. It's a very, I think one of the earlier versions of how social media and um, 
uh, you know, on the street surveillance could be used against what was a democratic movement, and that was frightening. Um, in terms of the idea of coalition, um, it was great what Daryl was saying before. And it's just absolutely fantastic in trying to get people out of their intellectual bunkers and talking to people they would not normally meet, not only have a chance to chat to and converse with rather than debate with. And I do want to give a shout out to one of the organizations that I currently work with, which is called the World Ethical Data Forum, where we do precisely this. So open invitation to all of you as speakers for our next year event because we do want all the different perspectives from all the different fields and get some sort of at least understanding, if not a creative solution to some of the problems that we are facing. And they are big. I just want to finish on this point. Um, this is something I call my dark triad, where we have the state level actors, the intelligence agencies, and then we have the corporations who can be working in collusion with them or not, wittingly or unwittingly. Um, and also other corporations that develop military-grade spy software that could be sold to dodgy regimes, such as the NSO and the Pegasus program. And then, of course, a lot of these nasty tools and nasty techniques fall into the hands of criminals. Now, all these three, I would suggest, are predators on our privacy and on our right to be active and involved citizenry in our democracies and are being misused as well in countries which are not notional Western democracies. So we need to... Be aware of this. Whistleblowers pay, pay a, play a part in getting that information out. And we need some more coming out, please. But we also need um, other techniques, such as open source investigation. And we need um, the geek community coming out with uh, security systems that can protect those who, wish, who choose to try and take these sort of fights forward. Because I'm talking, you know, from a perspective of someone who was involved in intelligence in the 90s, whistleblower in the 90s, involved over the last 20 years. So there's all sorts of wonderful stuff coming forward. We just need to be able to amplify that message, get some uh, coalition and collaboration going between interested parties and ensure that we can protect our, our way of life and, and our, our human rights and our citizens' rights. Otherwise, we are all screwed. So, But thank you very much to Tatiana and Disruption Lab for hosting this. It's been fabulous fun. And um, great luck, huge luck with the book as well. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Annie. And Daryl? Well, I would just conclude by saying, you know, there's, there's a stack of books out there, and, there's, and, and there is no reason why any one of those books should be left there. Um, you know, this has been a very uplifting and very inspiring uh, two days here uh, with the panel last night, with the panel earlier today, and with the panel right, uh, right now. And I know, you know that you all have encountered or will encounter at some point in your lives something that is just not right. And now you know how important it is to speak up, speak out, and do the right thing. And there are plenty of stories in, in those books that some never made the media, some were squashed and got lost in the media, and things like that. But that book is a tool that will help guide you and inspire you to do the right thing. And the more we have more people coming forward, you know, because the, the definition right now is very narrow. As to, as to what a whistleblower is. But the more we understand that and the more we can expand upon it, the sooner we can, we can address these problems when more people get involved. It's like <clears throat> in, in my country, the US, you know, it wasn't until the last two years that we started calling people who went around shooting up churches and synagogues domestic terrorists. Before that, we just called them, oh, you know, he has some health issues, some mental health issues. Well, anybody who bombs a church or shoots up multiple people has mental health issues, but that person is also a terrorist. In our country, we, we view terrorists as people from the Middle East, okay, you know, which is very racist or, or profiling because we got terrorists here. So now the definition has expanded, and we need to expand the definition of, of whistleblowing. And you people, you know, you've gotten firsthand information from the people themselves, from, from John Kiraku, from a, 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 a reality winner, from Annie Michonne, and from Barrett Brown, and um, Bob Trafford, and everybody. You know, I'm not, I'm not officially a whistleblower, but I tell the truth. So, you know, that book will inspire you. Pick up a copy for yourself, pick up a copy for your friends, and let's get this, let's get this show on the road. Brilliant.
Well, just a word of thanks from my side because this has been a pleasure to moderate you. You were basically moderating yourself and interacting with, with each other. So uh, a huge thanks, vielen Dank uh, that you made it this far today and uh, big thanks to the organizers, Tatiana, Lieke and everyone else, Nada. So big thanks from my side as well. Thank you. Thank you so much also from my side, from the Disruption Network Club side. And uh, thank you Annie, uh, Daryl, Robert and Peter for this uh, very interesting panel. I have to say, Daryl, I want to go to with you to any book presentation. <laughs> it's so great. I mean, uh, I am going to learn from you how to present this book. That was, it. <laughs> was such a great uh, uh, ending of these two days. Uh, and, uh, um, now you are free to leave the stage, but uh, I will call here with me uh, Lieke Plucher that uh, is going to announce what is happening tomorrow. And then we will also do the big finale uh, with our team uh, about uh, this year's program of the Disruption Network Club. All right, yeah, just before we really wrap up, um, this is the end, of course, of the conference, but the total program of this weekend is not over yet because we have another workshop day tomorrow. So I just wanted to mention briefly, there will be two workshops tomorrow, and for the one in the morning, we still have some spots left. So this workshop is about building secure whistleblowing platforms with global leaks, free open source software, and the workshop is by Rima Skyer of Team Community. And she will give there also a demo of the software and examples of how it's been used and also how you can contribute to future improvements. So if you're interested to join, there's still some spots free and you can sign up via the website. Um, in the afternoon, there will be another workshop by Agnese Trocchi, who's our digital communications manager. And this will be about uh, de-gamification. So she will take us on an investigation of gamification techniques, starting from vintage video games and ending up at social media apps and platforms. Of course, this was very popular workshop also, so it's already sold out, but yeah, who knows, we might do it again in the future and maybe see some of you there. Um, then if that was not enough, we also want to say some more things about some other projects we're currently running at the Disruption Network Lab and also some events that will still be happening this year. Um, so first of all, we're also at the moment running the project uh, Challenging Corruption, Empowering Future Voices. And this is a project that started um, last, uh, last summer and it's a series of workshops and online conversations. The project is funded by GEIZ, the German Agency for International Cooperation. And in this project we're reflecting with young people on new ways of challenging corruption in our societies and also to imagine tools and solutions together for future improvements. So uh, the next event in the series is a Disruptive Fridays at the end of January, and then more events also to follow in the early months of 2022. And then uh, last but not least, we're also running a project called Facing Disinformation, Media Diversity from Georgia to Germany. And this is a continuation of a project we started last year with the Georgia nonprofit organization, Regional Democratic Hub Caucasus and it's funded by the German Federal Foreign Office. So in this project, we're working with experts on disinformation and fake news in Georgia and Germany to offer insights on how to face disinformation in social media and beyond. And our Georgian project partner is currently running an online training course for participants from Georgia and neighboring countries. And we are hosting a series of Disruptive Fridays and also an online workshop. So the first of the Disruptive Fridays was actually detailing what the online course is about, also with some of the participants. And you can still watch this edition on our YouTube channel. And then on the 8th of December, we're going to host an online workshop on disinformation and the role of verification. And this is with uh, Michael El Sanadi of the Mnemonic organization, formerly also Syrian Archive. Uh, and there you can learn more about the role that verification plays in investigating online content and also, of course, identifying disinformation. And for this workshop, we also still have spots free and you can find information on our website. And then as the final event of the year on the 10th of December, we're hosting a Disruptive Fridays conversation. So this is our online conversation series. And this will be about, be about media disinformation during the coronavirus in Georgia and Germany. So we're excited to have as a speakers there, Kete van 
Kutsishvili, who is a myth detector, deputy editor from Georgia, and also Ivan Sigal, which is the Global Voices Executive Director. So the panel will be moderated by Maya Talakatsu, who is our collaboration partner from the Regional Democratic Hub Caucasus. So yeah, we still hope to see you there, even though it's online, but yeah, to conclude the year, this is what we have coming up. Yeah, and uh, as you can see, we have still a lot to do here. <laughs> so the year didn't finish, uh, but uh, we want also to announce what is going to happen next year and what is our first event. Um, <clears throat> as I say also, uh, at the beginning of this event, we are going to do a second step of the book launch, uh, in particular about uh, the drone program and the drone war. And uh, we want to invite the contributors of the book um, that have been specifically focusing on this uh, issue and we think is a very important issue here in Germany, but also globally. And so I can already announce uh, uh, that uh, the conference will be called Network Warfare and will be in March, uh, be between March 25 and 27. And uh, Lisa Ling will be with us, also Sean Westmoreland, and also again Brandon Bryant that we had here in the very beginning, uh, our keynote uh, in April 2015, our, our first event of the history of the Disruption Network Club. And then we are going to build up the program at the moment. And uh, yeah, so this is what is happening next. And uh, now we also want to conclude uh, uh, the year program uh, uh, by thanking uh, our team. So I want to start uh, first with uh, Elena Velianoska and also invite her to be here with us. She's coming. Coming. <laughs> we can start clapping. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we prepare a little surprise for you that uh, is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Elena. Um, then uh, we want to invite on stage Nada Bakker, uh, that also worked uh, together with Elena on the production. <laughs> Thank you, Nada. Then uh, we want to invite Jonas Franchi for the great design that uh, we all experience uh, in these days. Also the book. And the book design, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Agnese Trocchi, our digital communication manager. And workshop leader. A workshop leader of tomorrow with a wonderful uh, Great spice dress. track uh, dress. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, Lauren De Carli, that has been our legal <laughs> advisor and editor. He didn't expect Ooh, that. <laughs> that's a shock, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Also, was very important for our book. Uh, yes, and um, then I want to say thank you to Alice Bazzichelli, our program assistant. Woohoo! Woohoo! Now somebody has to give the flower to you. Yeah, yeah, the river production. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. And uh, later we want uh, to follow up by thanking the rest of our team, uh, Federica Mattioni for the press, and uh, the streaming Boiling Head Media, Rana Vnikari and all this team. Let's do a big applause to them. <laughs> and uh, Maria Silvano for the photography, sitting over there. <laughs> and. Uh, Paolo Combes for the sounds. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Francesco Mancori and Torsten Uken for the technology support. And then finally at the cash desk, uh, Sofia Grassi and all the helpers that help us to build up this place in these days. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Sofia left. And then the really big final thanks I want to give to Lieke Plucher that uh, 
has been with me for three years, uh, co-directing the Disruption Network Club, and this is also a big news uh, uh, and uh, something uh, for your life that I hope is going to turn uh, really in good. Um, and she is leaving the lab, so we are very sad to announce that. Uh, uh, but also, you know, we know that uh, change always brings a new beginning and uh, this was the start uh, of a new situation also for us with you and uh, so we wish you all the best and for me it was very important to have Lika with us for all this time. Uh, I would say she really contributed to change the Disruption Network Club in something wonderful. So thank you, Lika. Thank you. Do you want to say something? <laughs> I'll try to say something. <laughs> now, then I have the honor to, of course, say also the final thanks to Tatiana for three wonderful years of collaborating and for being with the lab. And yeah, as you know, life is full of changes and the only constant actually is change. But yeah, new times will come. And of course, I'll be following the Disruption Network Lab on the other side, so this is not the fi final goodbye. And yeah, also thanks, of course, for this great conference, because it was a beautiful one in a way to have as a final conference, because it gave an overview of everything the Disruption Lab has achieved, which is really awesome. So many thanks. Thank you, Lieke. <laughs> so let's start. <laughs> Not allowed during Corona, but we it's do. It's not filmed so anymore. Thank I think you it's okay. to everybody, and then see you tomorrow at the workshop. Thank you.